Well, thank you to uh, all those who have joined us on your lunch hour. So good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Muscles of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. I'm Jeremiah, and I'm the naturalist for the Wild Rivers Conservancy of the St. Croix and Namakagan Rivers. And I am Katie Sickman. I'm the Invasive Species Coordinator for the Wild Rivers Conservancy. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Conservancy, um, we are the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, a unit of the National Park Service. The Conservancy inspired stewardship to forever ensure the rare ecological integrity of the St. Croix and Namakagan River, Riverway. Um, as a nonprofit, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our important mission. If you are inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a member, a volunteer, or participating in one of our many upcoming events. And for those of you who are already supporters, thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> so before we begin, we just want to take a few moments to talk housekeeping uh, to ensure the best video quality between uh, the Wild Rivers Conservancy and our guests today. Uh, please keep your camera off and remain on mute. Um, since we do have a pretty small number of people today, I think this uh, can be a really interactive uh, webinar. So feel free to put questions anytime into the chat. Uh, we talked with uh, our presenter earlier about this, and he said that he uh, really likes it when the audience is engaged. So please feel free to ask as much as you want. Um, we only do have an hour though, just keep that in mind. Um, but this program is going to be recorded and a link will be sent out in a few days. Uh, there will also be a recording of this webinar posted on the Conservancy's YouTube channel. Awesome. And so today's uh, topic is mussels. So mussels of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. So for those of you that are not aware, the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway is home to over 40 species of freshwater mussels. Um, Mark will, I'm sure, be getting more into that. So we're going to be talking about how mussels are valuable to people, uh, mussel conservation uh, concerns, um, as well as interesting examples of how many, how mussels compete with their complete their life cycle. So it's gonna be a great webinar today. Um, and so I'm going to introduce our presenter, Mark Hovey. Mark Hovey is a research biologist at the University of Minnesota and McAllister College. He enjoys visiting streams and rivers to study and appreciate mussels, fishes, and other aquatic life. And I'll also throw in that Mark is a huge supporter of the Conservancy and the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway National Park Service. And we partner with him quite a bit, um, especially when it comes to muscle conservation on the riverway. So with that being said, please join us in welcoming Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate uh, the work that the Conservancy does and the Park Service and everybody who's attending and everybody who lives in the river uh, way because it's only through all of our joint efforts that we are really going to affect a bigger change and really appreciate and treasure this river way. It has so many things to offer. And what I wanted to do today is share some information about what very few people get to see. That is, um, I've spent a couple of decades scuba diving in the St. Croix River, and I've seen a lot of interesting things. I wanted to share some of the video and some of the stories that I've seen today. So um, there may be some questions. So I want to jump right into things. I'm going to launch the video. No, not the video. Uh, my PowerPoint. And so here's a shot that a bunch of you recognize where that is. Doesn't that look wonderful that you want to just be in a canoe or a boat, go swimming in the St. Croix? Okay, maybe a little cold for today. But I want to talk about what's going on under the water. Well, wait, not under the water. Under the water would be all the rocks and stuff that are at the bottom of the river, but what's in the water. Yes, I want to talk about what's in the water and what's resting on the bottom of the stream bed, the freshwater mussels. Here you can see one of the fed really listed species, the winged maple leaf. She is brooding her young and trying to attract a host fish. So some of you might not know what the life cycle is like for a freshwater mussel, but I'll get into that in just a minute. But I want to talk a little bit about freshwater mussels, why they're valuable to us, um, why people are concerned about their conserve uh, about conserving them, and then get into life cycle of freshwater mussels. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about some of those things. I just talked about their value of the mussels, diversity and conservation. Then my favorite part, um, like video documentaries. I love documentaries, like 
animals in Africa or South America and how they make a living. Well, this one's gonna be about our own backyard in the, the St. Croix River. So what are some of the values mussels have to us other than they're really beautiful, especially on the inside and the interesting texture on the outside, some of them. There's an economic benefit. Um, pearls, natural pearls are about 90% freshwater mussel uh, spheres. You, know, you can take a big freshwater mussel shell, core out some spheres, which are called blanks in the industry, uh, pearl manufacturing industry, and you slip that underneath the mantle of an oyster. And here you can see an oyster shell and that oyster um, will make a pearl out of that uh, blank. And uh, it's a multi-million dollar industry in the US to send these blanks to Asia and they make natural pearls, which ends up being a multi-billion dollar industry as they sell those, um, that jewelry around the planet. And I'm just waiting for an entrepreneurial American to try and kind of circumvent that whole process and start raising some pearls in, uh, in the US. But I understand there's quite a few tricks on how to do a good job in raising pearls. So uh, I'm sure it's challenging and that's why it hasn't been done yet, but it seems like an opportunity. Freshwater mussels, other mollusks have very interesting shells. Um, they have a nice balance between being really strong, but not so strong that they're brittle, right? You want to be able to flex in an environment like in the spring as the water is running down the river very quickly and rocks are kind of tumbling along the bottom of the river. If you have a really strong shell but brittle, you could crack. But if you have a, a strong shell but kind of resilient that can flex a little bit, that's just the kind of character you want if, to protect like this or the old space shuttle. Those tiles were designed in part by studying the composition and more importantly, the structure of the um, the mussels shells how the calcium carbonate layers were laid down so that they could improve the the toughness yet resiliency of the tiles on the space shuttle so material scientists have been studying mussels for that reason uh, but perhaps one of the greatest benefits that at least i and many of us enjoy is the fact that they're filtering the water day and night clarifying the water a lot of the fishes are visually oriented feeders and so they benefit from clearer water so here's a couple of pictures you can see at the top two aquaria on the right hand aquarium are some mussels left hand aquarium are no mussels as you look down the series of pictures to the bottom you can see the mussels on the right have clear water in 50 minutes five zero minutes and water is clearer on the left uh, because sediment has settled but it's not as clear as that with the mussels so they clarify the water to a great extent Oh, this is a neat picture that I borrowed from the Minnesota DNR. They have a picture, this is from up in Northwest Minnesota, and they show all these mussels covered in all sorts of interesting things. Algae grows more diverse and abundantly on mussel shells than live mussel shells than neighboring rocks or dead mussel shells next to them. So they're just like these gardens that insects and other invertebrates will feed upon. Here you can see a mussel with a bunch of caddisflies on it. And then <laughs> if you look over here, this one caddisfly has a snail feeding on its shell. And then there's a hydra sitting on the snail that's on the caddisfly, it's on the mussel. So it's the foundation literally for uh, part of the food web. Um, folks may know if they're thoughtful and know a fair amount about where they're angling on rivers. Here's a shot of the foot of Lake Pepin, and um, I wonder how many no anglers there know that they're actually above a big mussel bed. It's a very common place to fish for walleye, probably because they're attracted to the minnows and other fishes that are attracted to the um, food that the mussels are providing uh, on their shells to feed upon. So uh, that's another uh, reason, in addition to clarifying the water, just being a resource for uh, the local biota to feed upon. You know, if the water um, weren't captured by the mussels and if those mussels weren't processing uh, flotsam floating by into food and creating food pseudo feces too that the insects can feed upon, those nutrients might have otherwise been washed down streams. So they're kind of energizing the local ecosystem in that regard too. So some of kind of analogized uh, mussel beds is kind of like a freshwater coral reef kind of. So that's um, what I wanted to cover about freshwater mussel, the values of freshwater mussels to folks. And so um, for any questions, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll go on to 
diversity and conservation concerns about freshwater mussels. Going once, going gone. I'll talk about diversity. Um, if you look at the diversity of freshwater mussels in the world, I think of Africa and South America as really being hot spots for center, uh, biodiversity, and they are. But I was so surprised to learn that almost a third of all the freshwater mussel species on the planet are, occur in North America. And really, um, those of you who love biota and flora know that the southeast part of the U.S., right, down in the Appalachian Mountains, that's where the diversity occurs. And that's the same thing for mussels and snails and fishes. That's where the diversity really occurs. But we have quite a few species up here in the Midwest as well. So think globally, globally uh, act locally. Um, really applies to uh, conservation efforts for freshwater mussels. So uh, I don't like this graph, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. <laughs> the content is upsetting to me because it shows out of sight, out of mind, in my opinion. The Nature Conservancy put this graph together to show that um, of the different faunal and floral groups in the U.S. Um, and those that have a proportion of their species that are at risk but becoming endangered or extinct, the worst off are the top four there. They're all underwater, kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? If you don't know what's going on underwater and you don't see or appreciate what's happening, um, the mussels in particular are not doing well with about 70% of their the species listed as um, needing conservation attention. So um, when I learned that, I thought, man, I really wanna try and do something to help freshwater mussels out. And so I appreciate um, Katie and Jeremiah inviting me today to just share some thoughts about freshwater mussels and how interesting they are, and some of the struggles they're um, experiencing. Uh, you know, why, why aren't they doing very well? Well, one reason is because sediment runoff from land development or what intensively agriculturally developed land um, results in sediment running off into streams and I've gone into some streams and seen some of this, and I bet you've seen it when you're on the St. Croix River, you've seen those sand dunes that are just kind of slowly moving down the river. Um, the mussels and the fishes, the greatest diversity from what I've seen occurs on the more stable substrates, the gravel and the cobble beds. And you go in the middle of the river and it's kind of like in this lower right hand picture where you, <laughs> you, you see these kind of sand dunes, maybe they're not seven stories high like this, <laughs> but the sand dunes washing down the stream. And you know, if we, our group here of 19 people or so, if we are on this, in this farm trying to make a living with our little hand tools and donkey to pull carts around, and this seven story sand dune, not only just one sand dune, but a series of stand, sand dunes started washing across the, the desert or down the river, you know, we'd really be out of luck trying to do anything. We're gonna have to move, um, but mussels don't move very well. So they just oftentimes just get smothered and they're, they're wiped out that way. So trying to keep the sediment on the land seems to be a mutual interest among farmers and biologists because the farmers want the soil to stay on the land, right? So it seems like there's some great opportunities to try and keep soil on the land. Oh, another reason why uh, the mussels are struggling is because um, we've transformed large sections of river reaches into lakes. That is, by putting up dams, you have a lake kind of behind the dam and the um, diversity of habitats and the dynamic nature of the river is just not the same in an impoundment, a, a, a ponded part of the river as it is in a, a free flowing river. Not only that for the fishes and other animals can't move up and down the river as easily and the fishes are carrying the mussels actually. And so um, when you change, you know, if you were to go to, to um, some of the lakes in Minnesota and Wisconsin, We'd maybe find two, if we're on a really big lake, we might find four or five mussel species, but go to the St. Croix or Mississippi, we've got over 40, just because there's so many different habitats, so many different fish species that they're interacting with, all sorts of different dynamic, dynamics make for different niches. And so putting the dams simplifies the habitat, restricts animal movement. So that's a, that's a challenge too. So I was gonna go on to talking about my favorite part of the whole presentation, which is interesting life history behaviors. But if there are any questions people have about um, the value of freshwater mussels or diversity or conservation, I'd be happy to respond to people's questions.
I actually have a question mark. So it uh-huh. kind of dawned on me that I know that the St. Croix River is home to over 40 native freshwater mussels, but I guess how, how many freshwater mussels are there in total throughout the entire ecosystem? Like the St. Croix ecosystem? Or like the just species in general, oh, not yeah. necessarily the St. Croix. Yeah, I've, um, there's, you know, around 50 or so maybe in Minnesota and more, a few more in Wisconsin. And um, I have muscle species diversity envy as we get our, go further south into the east, go down to Missouri and they might have 60 or 70 and go to Alabama or Tennessee and they might have 90. And then in the US there's about 300 muscle species. Okay. And so we've got a fraction here and some of the species here, they don't have down south. <laughs> there are many species down south that we don't have up here. They may be coming up here um, as, as temperatures warm and whatnot, um, but um, really the diversity is down south, but it's a group effort because they can't conserve some of the mussel species we only have up here. And um, if some, let's say in the St. Croix River, the winged maple leaf wink out due to some catastrophe, we might be able to think about talking with some of our colleagues down in Missouri who still have a few wing maple leaf to bring them back up here or vice versa. And so with a group effort like that to conserve species diversity in the US, um, it's more likely that those uh, efforts will be successful. Awesome, and then that kind of leads into my next question pretty good. So with um, you know climate change and that being kind of at the forefront, um, I'm assuming that will threaten some of our native mussels in the St. Croix River. Um, is there much known about that or is that being studied? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are concerned about uh, climate change and so they've been studying different aspects. Um, mussels like trees, plants um, are really heavily influenced by temperature and so they use a lot of cues, photo period, water temperature, maybe stream flow to help them say, okay, I want to fine tune my behavior so I can you know, maybe release my young at this time, or maybe put on a lot of weight right now so I can have uh, energy reserves for the winter, or maybe I need to bury myself before, at this time, before the spring floods come. There's all sorts of um, timing mechanisms, if you will, that we're beginning to appreciate that occur within different aquatic organisms that um, they're using to help them live their lives well, as best they can in a very dynamic environment like seasonal changes and a dynamic riverine environment. And so I think it's fair to say that we know some basics about mussels and their life history needs, but how things are going to change with um, possible warming temperatures is really challenging. And so I think people's general wisdom about let's try and remove some of the insults we're doing, like adding sediment to river and maybe opening up the riverways so animals can move back and forth and repopulate areas on their own. I think allowing a healthy environment to respond as best it can do seasonal or not seasonal, but climate change um, will hedge our bets in the right direction. Awesome. Great. And then we have one more question in the chat. Um, Do you have any comments on mussels in the Willow River? Oh, oh yeah. Um, So I've been in the Willow River a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> and so a lot of times the mussels um, don't, the native mussels, there's cl- native clams that only live about a year or two and they're only about a centimeter long. And the mussels I'm talking about are kind of, when they're full grown, they might be an inch to maybe a big washboard might be 10 inches long. And it doesn't seem that long, but when you think about the biggest invertebrate, you know, might be a Dobson fly larva is three inches long. These are kind of the megafauna of the river, if you will, in terms of invertebrates. So they're they're really big, but in the really cold water streams or the cold, cold water inputs to the St. Croix River from all those springs, you know, I just don't see many native mussels. And so if you get to a tributary to the willow or you go further downstream in the willow, if it's a little bit warmer, maybe off on a side channel, then I'll see some um, native mussels, but usually all I see in the willow and some of the cold water streams where trout live are the little pill clams. Awesome, I think that's all in the chat. So can all right. continue with the presentation. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you for the, for the, presenta- or the, uh, the questions. It helps me kind of get a feel for what people are interested in. 
I'm going to talk about the uh, life cycle of a freshwater mussel. Um, <laughs> I gave this presentation in the past <laughs> and I got so excited to talk about some videos that I'm going to be showing you that I forgot to talk about the life cycle of the freshwater mussel and that's kind of important. So let me cover that. Here you can see um, the life cycle. A big mussel, female mussel here is about to release her young, her larva or, or glochidia is what scientists call them into the water. And she's hoping that she's going to encounter a fish, not just any fish, but usually kind of a family of fishes like the sunfishes or maybe the minnows. This mussel is adapted to the minnows or some mussels are adapted to just one fish species. I've been talking with many people and I think in Wisconsin and Minnesota, there's an interest in trying to change the conversation um, that kind of stemmed, I think from the 1950s that there are kind of junk fishes or rough fishes or trash fishes. Um, the idea being from many decades ago that if we get rid of all these competitors, get rid of the um, trash fishes, then maybe walleye and northern pike would do better. But since then, ecologists have shown that actually ecosystems are more resilient if you keep the different members of that ecosystem intact. And yes, there's some competition, but there's usually more benefits in having a, a fully, uh, a Flor um, a, but a full complement of fish species as opposed to just having one or two fishes that we like to catch a lot of, the ecosystem is more stable. And so um, the drum, freshwater drum is a mussel daycare center. <laughs> there are five species, three of which are listed as rare in the St. Croix River that only use the drum as a host. And so I'm really all for the idea of changing the conversation around trash fish to let's just call them non game fishes to appreciate the fact that they have important roles in the ecosystem. Just a few years ago, we found out that the moon eye, what a beautiful, interesting little fish, which is, to some is also considered a trash fish, is the only known host for a federally endangered spectacle case. It's a great big mussel that hasn't changed for almost 300 million years. It's really cool. It's host fish. The moon eye is similarly little evolved, just like sturgeon. They're an ancient line of fishes, the moon eye. And so I would really love the idea of treating the moon eye and the sturgeon and the spectacle case with the respect they deserve. They're just really neat ancient fishes. And so the mussel is trying to attach its young to a fish so that um, it can transform in, uh, into a juvenile. The transformation occurs in about a month for most mussel species. And if the juvenile is lucky, it will make it to the stream bed and grow into a juvenile or juvenile and then to an adult. But it's tough to get past all the predators that are in the riverbed um, and not many of them make it. So mussels tend to release thousands of glochidia larvae. So <clears throat> what I've been doing at the University of Minnesota is to try and figure out what fishes are our St. Croix River mussels using to complete their life cycle. There's so many, there's over a hundred. Um, you know, here's a picture of the rainbow uh, of the butterfly mussel, and you know, of all these different fishes I can consider, um, which is its host. And so we do tests to try and figure this out. And here you can see just to the upper right hand corner of the uh, butterfly picture is the drum, a little drum. And so um, there are many mussel species in the river. And so how how we've seen many interesting mussel behaviors. And so here you can see a couple of different mussels. Um, one is waving its mantle down at the bottom to complete its life cycle to try and get the young, the larva, the glochidia onto the fish's fins or gills. And then the mussels on the right, which I'm going to talk about first, are the glochidia broadcasters. They're the thin-shelled mussels. Here you can see a picture of its shell. Um, and they're releasing special kind of glochidia. The glochidia are really thick-shelled. The larvae are very thick shells. And then they have these big honking teeth, well, like with little teeth on the big teeth, so they can bite onto a fish's fin and so you can, or other soft tissue. So on the lower left, you can see a picture of glochidia attached to the fish's fin. Fish are really strong. I mean, they have to push through a really dense medium, right? Water to get around. So they're very strong. These muscle larvae have to be very even stronger to hold onto the fish's fin. And, uh, and one of the mussel species that you tend to find in some of the local streams this time of year, maybe in a, a month or so when the water warms up is the cylindrical paper shell. And here's a female, she's releasing her young in the lab. And if you look closely at the beaker, you can see these little threads. And along these little threads are little orange dots. And those are individual glochidia. 
And so I've got a shot here. You can hear the lab water running in the background. So I apologize for the audio component of this, but you can see, look at that, this flash light I'm shining over the Glaucidia. It's just a, a web, a mesh. And a lot of fish when they're sleeping at night, they just rest on the stream bed, go to sleep for a while. And if that's where there's a mesh of kind of Glaucidia, some of them might be lucky enough to pinch onto a fish. And when I've caught fish from the wild, trying to see if there's naturally infested Glaucidia on them, you know, I might see one or maybe a half a dozen Glaucidia on a fish. So it's not a very heavy load, kind of like ticks or a mosquito. I don't like them. Um, but if, you only, if I only have a few that bother me every once in a while, it's not that big a deal. And then when I think too, that if mussels often live 10 to 50 years, they're gonna be clarifying the water for that long. It seems like it's a pretty decent trade-off that the fish carries around a mussel larva for a month and then gets 20 years of clearer water and better feeding around it. So the Glaucidia broadcasters are one-way mussels trying to track their, um, trying to get their Glaucidia onto their um, host fish. And, and, um, and the next group is even, I think, more interesting than the mantle waivers. And I've got a couple of videos to show, but I think I see a new question in the chat line. Is there another question I should respond to or should I jump right into the next video? Yeah, so this is actually a great question that will go pretty well with what you're talking about. So Tony um, is asking, Moon Eye and Drum are both cool fish. Are there mussels that we don't know yet who the host is? <laughs> I bet, I bet. And, and, and white bass come to mind too. I mean, they travel around so much, right? They really move up and down this, up the river, up and down the rivers this time of year. And I thought, um, I was talking with some fishermen or anglers along the shore about 10, 12 years ago. And I was talking to them about mussels. And I said, oh, I wonder if any of the mussels are on these white bass. And I looked at their gills and oh my gosh, there were. And, and I brought some to the lab and oh my gosh, they were dropping all sorts of juvenile mussels. And, uh, but I didn't have, excuse me, the techniques I have now with scanning electron microscopy to try and identify them. And so moon eye and drum, and I'm sure many other fishes are carrying mussels that um, some of which we know, I think we are about a quarter to halfway there knowing what all the host fish relationships are. Um, but we have so much to learn about that. Um, I hope that answers the question. If not, please uh, pin me down, ask me a, a more specific <laughs> question if I didn't address what you're wondering about. Awesome. And then we have one more question from Jennifer. Um, can you, and you kind of answered this because uh, you said you saw the glycidia and the white bass gills, but can you see the glycidia with no magnification on the fish fins? Yeah, gills? but I'm glad I'm working with students at the U of M because I kind of do a lot of this squinting. <laughs> they can, they can look at it. It's like, oh yeah, look, I can see it here. It's like, oh good. I'm, I'm glad you can see that. That's great. I trust you. Let's let's move forward. So it's nice to work with many generations <laughs> in the research lab to take advantage of. You know, I've got some neat stories about research I can share with you. And if you can carry heavy things and use your good eyesight to see muscles on the stream bed, it's a bonus. You know, we're stronger together than we are apart. <laughs> awesome. So, all right. I want to. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I see it's 12:30, and I want to leave time for. Um, some more questions and some of these videos because the videos I think are really cool. So I wanted to get across here in this slide is to point out that fish have huge eyes uh, and mussels are taking advantage of that in a couple of ways. One group of mussels wave a portion of their skin. The skin is that, or the mantle is the tissue around the muscle that they use to grow their shell. And so what they'll do sometimes, they'll open their shells a little bit and stick a portion of their mantle out and go, check this out. If you're a visually oriented feeder, you might want to look at this. And it works sometimes. And oftentimes it doesn't, um, but sometimes it does. And I've been, the last four years, I've been spending some time videoing mussels in the river rather than in the lab. Oh my gosh. I bet some of you have seen like um, the sturgeon cam up on the Wolf River or seen some of these other underwater video opportunities. It's just so interesting to see what, what's really going on in the river and, 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 there, and you know, how kind of rare fishes are and, and how they interact. And anyway, um, I've realized that actually these mussels can wave their mantles to, for days 
before a fish might even come over and look at it. So it's very, it's a very interesting complex relationship. That I think we're just beginning to appreciate. And, and so I'm gonna talk about the mantle waivers in general. They aren't quite like the thin shelled mussels. You can see a pocketbook shell, it's thicker and it has teeth to prevent the shell from shifting. And the glochidia, the larvae, if you look at them, they're not with those big honking fangs that we saw before, they're attaching to the gills. It's smart to be a good parasite and not hurt your host. So they, instead of the big teeth, they have like um, sandpaper teeth, just like a sunfish kind of, and just a, I'm gonna hold onto your gill just gently so that I'm not hurting you because I would love to have you, the fish, around for many generations of my young to facilitate metamorphosis of the young. So um, I used to kind of hate parasites, like why don't you make a living on your own? But then I thought, well, maybe parasitism is better than predation where you're killing the thing you're eating. Maybe it's, they're being kind of um, thoughtful predators and not killing what they're eating, but just letting it live. And so I'm still struggling with the whole conversation about, about parasitism, but that's where I'm at anyway right now about thinking about how are parasites good or bad. Um, here you can see, oh, this answers the question the person had earlier. This is what these little white dots look like on a fish's gills. They're just little places where um, they can be mistaken for some fish lice too, a crustacean, but they're little, little, little white dots pinched onto a fin or a gill. And so the mantles of some of these muscles can be really ornate. Here you can see in the top picture, this has an eye spot. A lot of predators will grab a hold of an animal's head to try and control it better when they're feeding upon it. So some of these um, mantles have even tails or special colors. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see this one has fantastic tentacles. But what I want to draw your attention to is between the mantles are those two pillow-shaped structures. The inflated gills are being pushed beyond the edges of the shell, and those are full of glochidia. So when a fish grabs a hold of that mantle, and sometimes I've seen mantles in the river torn off, like they'll sometimes tear a chunk off of the animal and get a snack. At the same time, the glochidia are released and probably a bunch of them get eaten, but at the same time, some snap have a chance to snap onto the fish's fin or gill. And if it's the right fish host, then it has a chance to metamorphose into a juvenile. So the pocketbook are gonna be out, coming out of the stream bed um, pretty soon. And they're looking to fool some smallmouth bass, which are very common, as you know, in the St. Croix. And I think they may be trying to imitate a, a white sucker, which tends to spend time just above the riverbed, right? And here you can see at night, not only is it kind of a gray structure, Kind of just above the stream bed, but it's not—it's not just hovering right on the bottom, where it'd be easy for the mussel. The mussel actually came up out of the substrate a little bit, pushed its mantle up, and then up in the water column, it has this lure waving, and it's using the current to kind of help give it some lifelike action. And and it's not super realistic, but um, what I've noticed out in the river is fish are so fast; it's hard to get food, and there isn't a whole lot of food. And in the dark. Maybe you will strike first and ask questions later. And so I think the muscle, the lure just has to be good enough. Here's another example of a muscle that's going after trying to fool a smallmouth bass. It's the federally endangered Higgins eye. I show you these three pictures of young Higgins eye. We think they're all the same species, but man, they're sure different colors, aren't they? And I think what it's trying to do is imitate a darter. Uh, and a darter is a small fish, maybe three inches long, and they live, they're very inquisitive. They live on the stream bed and they look around rocks for insects to eat. They have really good eyesight. And I think they're pretty bright. When I feed them in the lab, they come to the aquarium side and they'll be waiting for me to food, feed them food. And I'll bring food at the top of the tank. They'll come up to the surface they're, They learn quickly. And here you can see their behavior. Unlike the sucker, which is constantly moving, the these guys kind of hop along the bottom of the river and the Higgins eye lure, it's right on the stream bed and it's not very big and it kind of twitches. It's not constantly hovering, it kind of twitches. So apparently uh, it's important to a smallmouth bass that not only does the food item, the lure look good, but it has to kind of behave, act, uh, not actually behave realistically. So it's interesting to me, I think that these lures um, I think aren't thought up by a muscle 
to try and fool a fish. <laughs> they only have three kind of big neurons. They don't have, really have a brain. I think what we're seeing is we're getting an insight into the how the fish thinks. And so if you're interested in improving your angling ability, I would urge you to look at how mussels are trying to attract their hosts because that's how that smallmouth bass and that's how the or walleye have been fooled over time. So now I want to show you an example of a fish or a mussel that's fooled or is trying to fool sauger and walleye. The black sand shell this September will be coming out of the riverbed. Maybe you've seen these things are one of the biggest in the St. Croix and they make the biggest mantle lure of all St. Croix River mussels, maybe even in the US. The, the lures can be almost six inches long and they look kind of crazy. They have an eye spot, they have these big tentacles and, and, and between the two mantles, you can see the swollen white gills full of glaucidia waiting for a fish to come by and bite it. And here you can see it in the, the river and you know maybe it looks like a dobson fly but you know maybe it's not even trying to imitate something have you ever gone to a bait store and you've seen some of these lures like a daredevil or some of these other lures that like really don't look like <laughs> a food item to a fish or at least to me but maybe if they have the right action that's what the walleye is interested in here you can see the mantles moving you can see the gills were full of glaucidia between the mantles that are waving and so um, I've never seen a, a, a lure quite like this at the bait store, um, but maybe you could make one up. Anyway, there's a number of different videos online. You can study how um, mussels are trying to attract fish and maybe you'll get some insight on how the fish is thinking. All right, the last one that I wanna show you about a mantle waver is um, a mussel in Wisconsin. And I wish we had some of these because you're gonna love this. Um, Crayfish are a, a delightful food item to smallmouth bass. And here's how a crayfish moves. They kind of stop, look around. Oh, is there a smallmouth bass? And they move ahead. They stop, look around, move ahead. And you know, if they get startled, they'll swim backwards. Well, here's the rainbow mussel. Stop. Oh, it's got an eye spot. It kind of moves around, <laughs> kind of moves around, moves around. Oh, and now it's going to, oh, I better go back to my old place. It kind of darts back just like a crayfish would. It's just, it's just amazing to me that something like that would evolve. And so um, if you get to Eastern Wisconsin by Milwaukee, there's a few places, like a few streams left is all where the rainbow mussel is found. But if you're lucky, you'll get to see one of these three inch mussels trying to attract um, an aggressive uh, sunfish, like a smallmouth bass or largemouth bass. So let's see, the last group of mussels that I wanted to talk about um, instead of waving a mantle to, you know, come hither fish, come look at my, my lure, and strike at it, if you will. These mussels are gonna do something different altogether. They're gonna package their young to, into little jelly packets um, uh, and, and called conglutinates. And so I wanted to show you a couple of shots of conglutinates, but maybe, maybe there's a question about mantle waving or any, some of the behaviors we've talked about so far. Should I respond? Is there any questions or should I move on? Talk about conglutinates. We do, we do have a question. Um, however, it might be a little off topic of what you're talking about now. So we could save it for the 15 minute Q and A if you'd like. Yeah, I like it. Thanks for the okay. um, feedback. All right, so I don't have much time left. So that'll leave some time um, or I don't have much of the presentation left. So we'll have time for questions at the end. Wabash pig toe um, is commonly found in the St. Croix River along the sandy shores in the summer. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these kind of triangular brown guys. They're kind of common. They come into the shallows. And I think what they're doing, I don't know, dang it, I wish we were together and I could get a raise of hands. So, um, but I bet some of you have seen in the summer when minnows come into the shallows in the evening. And from what I've learned from my history, not history, um, fisheries professor when I was taking a class up at uh, Lake Itasca when I was an undergraduate, um, he showed us dramatically how the fish fauna in shallow water changes from the day into night and that you can get sometimes 10 times the abundance of small fishes, minnows at night than during the day. And the, I, I wonder if it's coincidence or not that this Wabash pig toe comes into the shallows at night to release its conglutinates. A lot of fish like eating little midge larvae. Here you can see a red one on this picture, a blood worm, and they're tiny and just like perfect fish mouth shape. 
And uh, here you can see the conglutinase produced by the Wabash Picto. She's going to be releasing little one centimeter skinny little tubes. Um, and the red of the conglutinate is uh, unfertilized eggs. So she's trying to give a nice color. And I bet they have a good texture and perhaps a yummy smell, but I've never smelled or tasted one. I'll have to ask a fish sometime. And then the clear spots between the red spots are where the glycidia are. So you can imagine a, a minnow picking one up and chewing on some things and then probably eating a whole bunch of the glycidia, but some of them are probably being released from the conglutinate at the time they're being eaten and I have a chance to snap onto the, the fish's gill. So that's a pretty tricky way to try and um, fool your host and you know give, give your host a snack at the same time. So kind of, um, again, supporting, supporting that thing you're kind of preying on rather than killing it, just parasitizing it and giving it a snack and then a better environment to live in. Um, once the young leave the minnow, fall to the stream bed and start filtering and clearing the water for the fish to find food more easily and growing more algae on its shell that the insects feed upon that then the fish can then later feed on. It's all wonderfully tied together. And I bet it's even more amazing how things are tied together than I appreciate. Young, young people in the audience will be able to share even better stories in the future than what I can share today. All right, so the last example of conglutinate producers I'm gonna share um, with you now is it, it doesn't occur up here, at least not anymore. Um, it may have at one time, um, but it does live still down in Missouri and it's called the fluted kidney shell. And we talked earlier about the darter. Um, the darter is one of the most successful groups in the perch family. Perches include walleye, sauger, perches, and darters, and some other fishes. And darters, you can see a male rainbow darter pictured here. Um, look at the coloration. It's in breeding season. Apparently, very distinct, ornate colors are visible and desired by the females or perhaps threatened. Uh, it's used to threaten other males. I don't know um, which it is, uh, but it fits in with what I was talking about earlier about darters having just really good eyesight and being really inquisitive. If you're gonna fool a darter, good luck. This muscle has an impressive job to try and fool a darter. She's released her conglutinates. They look like this from a distance. But if you look at them more closely, wow, there's a lot there. If I look at it really closely, look at all the different kinds of pigments and, and what are these little feathery things coming off the top? I think it's trying to imitate the black fly at Dupe. Black flies are pretty common in rivers and they have these little filaments coming off the top by their head that they use to uh, get oxygen from the water. And they kind of have these eye spots where their head is, as does the conglutinate. Look at that conglutinate. Right in the middle here, it has abdominal segments, which apparently are needed in the lure to try and fool a darter. Darter is really bright. <laughs> that it needs apparently, it's such an ornate, carefully constructed conglutinate to fool it. I bet those darters have really good eyesight. And so you can see another shot of the conglutinate. And if you actually strike where the eye spot is, it's really easy to break open a conglutinate at that point and it releases a whole bunch of yummy snack snacks for the darter. Um, it gets a, a mouthful of glochidia um, and probably gets to eat some, but probably coughs out a whole bunch of them too. But in that whole process, some of the glochidia get attached to its gills. And you can see the um, glochidia are not the ones with the big fangs, but the ones that hold on kind of gently to the fish's gills so they don't hurt it much. All right, so in conclusion, um, we've talked a little bit about the value of freshwater mussels, economic, technological, and how they're clarifying the water for us. And talked about how we've got a wonderful diversity of mussels here in the US. And um, some of the threats, you know, trying to keep that soil on the land where we need it to grow wonderful gardens. Um, and thinking about how to uh, maybe remove dams and, um, and other insults, you know, um, toxicants, uh, pesticides entering water remove some of those hindrances. I think it'll allow these mussels and fishes to better recover or withstand changes in climate that are occurring. And then there's all sorts of interesting behaviors that I hope you've enjoyed learning about. And with these um, interesting animals, they're pretty resilient 
and they've got a lot going for them. And, and we're a number of people are trying to help them out and with our combined efforts, so the muscles intrinsic abilities and our efforts to try and work on conserving them. I think we can get them back on their feet, on their foot. And yes, get them back up. And so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to respond to any questions that folks might have it's about muscles. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. My mind is still blown about the fluted kidney shell making those, uh, those uh, what were they called again? Those little the, the little jelly packets are called conglutinates. It's a conglutination of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, there's very little money in trying to do muscle research because the muscles just aren't economically valuable to us at this point. And so not many people are studying them. And so I just urge people who might be working with high school or who want to do a science project, it wouldn't be that hard to, you know, bring some muscles in the lab, maybe see what they're doing when they release their young. They're like, oh my gosh, let's take some pictures. I wonder if anybody's seen these before. And so there's a, a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of learning more about muscles like the kidney shell. For sure. No, that's insane. But thank you for that presentation. And yeah. We have uh, 14 minutes left to do some Q&A. So if anybody has anything, please feel free. We uh, do have some in the chat. So um, with, the, with the extreme dryness we had this past summer, um, there was many mussels stranded and the DNR and the National Park Service didn't have a lot for, uh, for us to do. So what, uh, what are your thoughts on the vigilante mussel movers? <laughs> I applaud them. I was part of an email string where Wisconsin and Minnesota DNR biologists were saying, should we let, should we enforce laws that say you should not handle state or federally listed species? You know, it's not common sense though, if we're going to say that's a federally endangered species. I know it's about to dry up and die, but you can't handle it without a permit. That doesn't make sense. And I'm so glad that one of the um, turtle biologists um, said, hey, there's a precedent. Um, you can take a turtle, a Blanding's turtle that's crossing a road and help it to the other side without a permit. So why shouldn't that apply to mussels? And so my, although I didn't, I'm not a policymaker, I didn't understand the exact results of what their plan was. It was my idea that they were thinking, yeah, that should apply to mussels too. So I regularly go out canoeing and um, if I see mussels getting stranded and I don't think they're going to make it, you know, toss them into deeper water. Um, again, this ties back to, you know, droughts are natural, um, but then rivers are naturally connected. So if certain species wink out in a certain reach of river, the adjacent river can often be used to reseed that river. So I think connecting the rivers, although it has some drawbacks like allowing Asian carp to get move around more easily. Um, I think in the long run, it's going to help the native species adapted to these river systems in the US um, do, do better. So like a lot of things in nature, there's no black and white answers. It's usually pros and cons. And so I'm at least my current thinking leaning on, yeah, let's try and help the mussels get back on the river and try and connect the rivers and keep them healthy so that the animals living therein can um, we can enjoy and eat if we would like and into the future. Well, great. Thank you for uh, that answer. Uh, the person who asked it, Gary, also wanted to mention that they moved 3,500 mussels over the course of two weeks. So, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I wished I had a, uh, I don't know, um, a virtual medal. Right. <laughs> Good work, it Gary. On your chest and your friends. That, at, it's stories like these that just make me a little teary, to be honest. It's like people really care. A lot, I hear on the news, you know, so many sad and frustrating stories. But when I hear stories like that, it's, I'm reminded that, and every time I work with high school students, they're so wonderful. So many are so wonderful. There's just a lot of good in the world, too. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so we do have uh, some more questions, it looks like. Um, so does the St. Croix River itself? have a microplastics problem and then do microplastics uh, affect the muscles in a negative way? Mm. Two great questions. So I'm not up on the literature on microplastics or what 
the concerns are for the St. Croix or Mississippi. And so we'll have to talk with a person more knowledgeable than me. And similarly, um, my colleagues working with freshwater mussels in the toxicology field that is trying to figure out what is toxic, what are toxic levels of uh, in, in, in runoff from especially industrial farms or feedlots, what are toxic levels to mussels, um, have their hands full trying to, well, they never catch up with all the different kinds of pesticides that are being introduced into farms, but they do their best. And there aren't many studies that I'm aware of that have shown how microplastics are affecting um, upper Mississippi River mussels. Um, I think there have been some on some other species. So uh, I'd have to look at the literature. I apologize. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Uh, mussels have some nice ways to um, filter out wa uh, large particles and waters they don't want to um, feed upon with the cilia they have in front of their incurrent aperture or their little siphon. Um, but if they're microplastics and they can get past them, then they might end up being sorted out by the cilia on the gills. Um, but if they're not so sorted out the cilia on their gills, they might go through their gut and they're probably not going to be, there might be some algae bacteria growing on the microplastics that could be food for the muscle. So I hope they can pass it through their gut into the, into their pseudofeces. Um, I haven't heard about them building up, but um, it doesn't, it's a, uh, it's an important concern. So I'm glad you're thinking about it and querying people. It is a very good question. Um, yeah. Uh, so here's another question from Troy. I often find Wabash pig toe in finer sediments, including mud. Are the mussels uh, sedentary in these shallow areas around? How do they survive the sediment loads? Yeah, wow, good question. I really appreciate your careful eye, Troy. Um, and, you know, maybe you could help answer this too. I've noticed that the Wabash Big Toe get in the sediment, the finer sediments in the summer, but then I never really go back in the spring or in the fall to see if they're still there. Are they moving into the shallows in the summer or are they always there? But it's my sense generally is that they, I usually find Wabash Big Toe a little bit deeper and that they might be going in and out. Um, and, and I've found them kind of like you're describing in sometimes really pretty fine sediments, maybe not just really loose flocculent, but, you know, fine sediment silt mixed in with, um, sand and, um, but that's about, um, all, all I've observed of, of the muscles and, and I've never really found individuals that have died suggesting to me that they succumbed to that soft sediment and sank and maybe found themselves in a oxygen less environment and they died. Um, so those are, those are the, some of the thoughts that come to my mind with what I've seen about Wabash Big Toe in the St. Croix. Jeremiah, did I get all of Troy's question? Was there some more to it? Yeah, I think, uh, so how do they survive the sediment load? Yeah, yeah, good question. Two things come to mind on how mussels survive sediment. Um, one is if there's a tremendous sediment load coming by, like a big fish moves its tail across the water and just dumps a bunch of sand on you, often they just close up and they can stay closed for hours. And so I think that could serve them in situations where maybe now when there's a lot of sediment coming down streams, just to open a little bit or, or stay shut. And, and they can even, if they're through their physiology of acids build up in their um, blood, they can actually um, neutralize some of those acids by using some of their calcium carbonate in their shell. And so they can stay shut for a long period of time, but they're still going to have to respire. So they have to breathe a little bit. So when they open the gap in between their shells, they can um, also use those papillae on their apertures to try and filter out most of the sediment. Um, sometimes too, um, you'll see <laughs> biologists like myself are kind of wimpy um, it would be so interesting to know what muscles are doing for half of the year during the winter, but I don't want to go out there. It's so cold, <laughs> but some colleagues in Ohio have found that muscles are doing very interesting and different things during the winter. And so some actually go down in the riverbed. And so you can to live the winter in the sand, completely buried. And so you can see why it's important not to have too many fine sediments collecting in the river, because if those 
sand gravel beds get covered with sand or fine materials, then water is not going to be able to percolate through the sand and if muscles hiding down in the gravel kind of get smothered out on top. Well, now it's no longer a refuge and they get they die down there and that might be an important part of how they can live in the gravel and not have to deal with the fine sand blowing up overhead they can just feed on the interstitial water between the gravel so behaviorally closing their shell uh, filtering anatomically the fine particles the heavy particles out of the shell or behaviorally they can move to a new area like in the sand to uh, or gravel more probably more likely to feed there or just respire there or just protect themselves from things going on above like rocks kind of crunching along or a big fish feeding on sturgeon or something feeding on mussels. There's, those are some ways um, that come to my mind. They can uh, also too, I mentioned that the cilia on the gills sorts different kinds of particles out so they can kind of poof out the materials, the sediment that they don't want to eat and the finer particles they do want to eat. They can bring that down to their oral groove and, and into their gut. Great, awesome. Um... We do have, uh, so I think we're going to take this last question, which is kind of a, a good one, an interesting one at least. Uh, what's the likelihood of getting the dam removed at Taylor's Falls? Oh, <laughs> I think it, it'll be complex, right? Some people would love to keep it. Some people would like to get rid of it. There's pros and cons. It's costly to maintain. You know, the one place where you find the greatest diversity of St. Croix River mussels that's just below the dam. And if there's decades of sand built up behind the dam, and there is, what's going to happen if you release that sediment all at once? It could wipe out the last, the spectacle case, when you may believe another federally endangered species that are left in the upper Midwest because it's they only occur in the St. Croix River at just below the dam. So if we're going to remove the dam, I hope it's done carefully, very thoughtfully. Um, but I don't know. I think it's a conversation that a lot of people need to share their thoughts about and think through well so that um, that important structure is, is, is maintained or removed thoughtfully. Awesome response. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think we're getting close to the end. So Katie, if you want to kind of take over. to figure out how to unmute myself still learning the the zoom in and outs but yeah no we just wanted to say um uh thank you very much mark for a, a fantastic presentation i was i guess jeremiah and i were both kind of motivated by the topic that we got to choose this month because we're so interested in freshwater mussels and and all that so thank you again i did uh put a, a survey in the chat box so if you could take three minutes um, to fill out that survey, it helps us choose um, future topics and continue the webinar series for years to come. Uh, we hope to see you all at other events and programs in the future, especially once the weather warms up and we can get outside. Um, and again, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing with us today and all of you that have joined us. Um, and so just kind of as a Last remark here, um, like I said, this is our last um, Lunch and Learn webinar series for this spring, but we do have a lot of awesome events coming up. Um, the, I guess the closest one to us is the Wild Rivers Fest. Um, and so you can register for that um, at the link that Jeremiah had provided earlier in the chat. Um, it's very family um, group oriented. It's going to be at Franconia, there's going to be food trucks, uh, beverages, bands, um, learn more about the Wild Rivers Conservancy and all of our work that we do and just help us kind of bring in the spring and bring in the, the summer season. So, um, and then to learn more about the Wild Rivers Conservancy and view other upcoming events, please visit at, at our website at wildriversconservancy.org. Um, or you can also sign up for our newsletter, which comes virtually through either um, you know, uh, your email or we have uh, uh, paper copies as well through mail. So uh, with that being said, thanks again for attending. Special thank you to Mark and have a wonderful rest of your day.